Welcome. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, my name is Bill Jeffries, and I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Medical Education at the College of Medicine. Uh, and I want to welcome you to the second annual uh, Health Equity Lecture that, that we hold as part of our Martin Luther King Jr. celebration. Uh, the life and work of Dr. King are being remembered across the UVM campus this week, as I'm sure you all know, uh, both to celebrate his accomplishments uh, and also to remind us of the work that still needs to be done to realize his vision uh, for our society. And here at the College of Medicine, we take particular note of Dr. King's statement that of all forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. So this series was established last year to uh, explore matters of health inequity within our system of health care. And I look forward to hearing uh, Dr. Shabazz uh, this evening. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Rick Morin, who would have been here. Uh, he's out of town. Um, he had a, uh, was taking care of his uh, stepfather and mother, who uh, uh, there's a surgery in the family. So he, he definitely would have wanted to be here. Uh, but I want to acknowledge his support in um, uh, continuing diversity and inclusion efforts here at the college. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Dean's Advisory Committee or, on Diversity and Inclusion for all of their work here at the college and their role in keeping us focused on these important aspects of our mission. And I'd like to thank the Office of Diversity and Inclusion for organizing this and other recent events, in particular the Director of the Office, Stephanie Delaney, uh, and Dr. Margaret Tando, who is the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, I'd also like to formally welcome Dr. Tando back to UVM after her recent service in Liberia. Her work there setting up and staffing an Ebola clinic serves as a vibrant reminder to all of us who value uh, the, our own tenets of professionalism in action. And for those of you who haven't seen them, our tenets of professionalism are uh, posted outside of this door out here. Um, the ones that are most Important here are altruism, compassion and empathy, and most importantly, in Dr. Tando's case, duty and service. Considering her sacrifice, it's no mystery as to why the Ebola fighters were named as the 2014 Time Persons of the Year. So here she is in order to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Margaret Tando. Thank you very much, Dr. Jeffries. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming today. I have to say I'm glad to be back home, no PPE, and uh, Ebola free. Um, I want to actually take, say a special thank you to Tiffany. She's done all the work because I wasn't here. And the Dean's Advisory Committee on uh, Diversity and Inclusion. Um, a special thanks to Dr. Uh, Deborah Leonard that uh, took, took, um, took my place while, while I was gone. Um, I want to welcome and thank you all for coming today uh, for, to our second annual MLK Health Equity Lecture. Um, as Dr. Jeffrey said, my name is Margaret uh, Tando, and it's my privilege to really introduce our speaker, uh, keynote speaker this evening, uh, Dr. Rashad Shabazz. Our program today is really made possible by, um, by the hard work and uh, collaboration of many of our campus and uh, community colleagues. Uh, we want, we're especially gr grateful to uh, Dean Morin for um, who, is the, who is the dean of the College of uh, Medicine and is not able to be here with us to, um, tonight, but it's with his vision and um, support that we are actually able to um, connect with Dr. King's ideals and so be educated, inspired, and uh, motivated to uh, action. Um, our MLK celebration infuses UVM core values. We all know it is, is our common ground, respect, integrity, innovation, openness, justice, and uh, responsibility. It's my honor now to introduce um, our assistant professor of geography and uh, professor of political science and affiliate faculty of the Alana US Ethnic Studies and Women's and Gender Studies. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> at, uh, <laughs> at, um, at UVM, Dr. Rashad Shabazz. Dr. Shabazz's academic expertise brings uh, together theories of um, racism, 
race and racism in black cultural studies, uh, gender studies, and uh, critical prison uh, studies within a uh, framework that, that draws on history, human geography, philosophy, and uh, literature. His research explores ways in which race, class, sexuality, and um, gender articulate through geographies of anti-black racism. Uh, he holds a BA in um, political science and uh, philosophy from the Minnesota State University. We're talking about the Boundary Waters a little bit. And, uh, and a, a master's from the School of uh, Justice at uh, Arizona State University and a PhD from uh, the um, for the history of consciousness. Wow, program at the University of California. Man, Shabazz, this is just Rashad. This is making me just. I guess, I'm just dumb old surgeon. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a lot of it's like a lot of words here. <laughs> well, please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Rashad Shabazz, our our speaker tonight. Wow, 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 an Ebola fighter, you know, wow. Um, thank you all uh, for being here tonight, uh, Margaret, Tiffany, uh, the College of Medicine. Uh, it's a real honor and privilege. Is this working well first? I just want to do the tech check, all right. Um, this is a real honor and privilege to be here with you all tonight, especially uh, to speak to the med students. How many, just, uh, just by show of hands real quick, how many med students are in the house? Okay, good. Uh, you know, I, I actually tried to tailor my talk specifically to you all. And so if people who are not med students start to roll their eyes at the facts and figures I can just blame y'all all, <laughs> and, and, it, and it's good. Um, no, this is, a real, this is a real honor and privilege to be here. And um, I'm going to present some research that I've been doing oh, for a number of years. And it is, um, it is actually part of a book project of mine that is actually coming out on September the 15th, uh, 2015. And so I'm going to present the final chapter of that work. I'll just give you sort of a, an, over, um, an overarching perspective of the book, and then I'll talk specifically about the work that I'm going to do today. So as the introduction uh, stated, I am a, uh, I'm a proud geographer, you know, proud, proud geographer. Uh, I am. And the, the people in the geography department uh, made me such. And so I will always carry that label of a geographer. Um, and, and my work looks at race, gender, and sexuality. And my, the book, which is titled Spatializing Blackness, looks at the relationship between race, space, and gender in Chicago, pretty much from the years right after the First World War up until the early 2000s. And what the book argues is that, uh, so I had to throw out just a few technical terms, but I will, I'll be sure to explain them that uh, carceral mechanisms. So those are the things that make prison and sites of detention work. Things like containment, surveillance, enclosure, policing. Right? You remove those from carceral institutions and you have to call them effectively something else. So I look at the ways in which these practices are woven into the quotidian or everyday places that black people live and are raised in on the south side of Chicago, which is where I was born and raised. So I look at that in terms of housing and architecture, zoning. Um, I look at it in terms of the formation of homes. And then I, I interrogate how it impacts the production or performance of black masculinity. And I also look at the health implications that those spatial manifest, manifestations produce. And so the book is you know, sort of partial spatial history, partial gender analysis, and part part health analysis. And I'm going to produce, I'm going to present the health analysis uh, for, for you all tonight. Uh, and the title of my talk is uh, Ghost Mapping the Geography of Risk in Black Chicago. And so let me just say one more thing about the talk, and then I'll just go ahead and dive in. Um, so my, my lecturing style is, um, 
is as such. So, you know, I have a script here and I'm going to, you know, spend part of the time uh, drawing from my script. Other times will be extemporaneous. You know, for those of you who like rap music, I will freestyle. And, um, and then other times I will simply go off script in order to belabor a point, to demonstrate better, or to um, speak to the various slides that I have. Uh, and last thing um, I want to say is that my talk is going to be about 50 minutes. And this is the evening time in the winter. And I know how you know, attention spans get really thin during this time. So I will be sure to make it engaging enough for you. So you can like look at me and hear my voice. And I wore the suit for you so that you had something good to look at. But I also got some, um, also got some images for you to look at. OK. All right, y'all ready? Yeah. All right, let's, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so opening quote of my talk. Ever since he observed the killing worth mining outbreak as a young apprentice, Dr. Snow had long known that epidemics tend to afflict the lower orders of society. For whatever reason, probably some mix of rational observation and his own social awareness, that disparity led Snow to, to seek external causes, not internal ones. The poor were dying in disproportionate numbers, not because they suffered from moral failings. They were dying because they were being poisoned. And that's from Stephen Johnson's book, The Ghost Map. In November of 1984, 26-year-old Lester Wall was the first prisoner in the Illinois Department of Corrections, henceforth IDOC, to die of, to die of AIDS. Wall was incarcerated earlier that year on burglary charges. He spent part of the year at Cook County Jail. He was transferred to a correctional facility in Joliet, Illinois, where he, where he was screened and classified. After their short stay at Joliet, Wall was assigned to the Centralia Correctional Facility in May. In September, he was transferred again to the Menard Correctional Facility. Wall most likely entered the prison system with the disease. Immediately after his death, the IDOC began checking to see if the disease had been passed on to other prisoners. In 1987, four more people died of AIDS in the state's prisons. The fifth fatality was the first to involve a woman uh, and the eighth documented case in the IDOC since 1984. She was 41 years old. The deceased most likely entered the prison with the disease, probably through intravenous drug use. The second to, to die was a 34-year-old man in Stateville Penitentiary. The third, a 22-year-old man in Centralia again. And the fourth, a 34-year-old man from Danville Correctional Facility. The medical doctor believed that this man might have been infected while in prison, possibly through the use of a tattoo machine or tattoo equipment. These cases represent the reality of HIV AIDS, race, and location. Each of these deaths is a commentary on the ways HIV AIDS, race, and space work together to create risk that overwhelmingly or disproportionately affects black Chicago. Now, few records exist that can tell us more about the expired prisoners. Nevertheless, information can be gleaned about them. Lester Wall was from Chicago. This is important because Chicago was the largest feeder of the state prison system, and still is to this day, since, uh, since the early 1970s, owing this in large part to the expansion of the carceral state or those prison mechanisms, and most importantly, the war on drugs, which I will talk about at length. The fifth prisoner to die from the disease was also from Chicago. Though no information about the other prisoners is available, given that Chicago was the main feeder of the prisons, of, of, uh, of prisoners, and also, the slide I want to show you, uh, that, is, that is the, uh, newspaper article uh, from 1984 regarding Lester Wall. Okay, uh, though no information of these prisoners is available, given that Chicago was the main feeder and was uh, main feeder 
and also given that in the early years, Chicago was ground zero for the spread of HIV, it's likely that most of the five, if not all of the five prisoners that died from AIDS-related disease hailed from my hometown. My talk today examines the public health crisis created by incarceration in Illinois and the impact it had on black Chicago. My argument is simple yet provocative. I argue that mass incarceration, which swept these five individuals into prison before their death from the disease, profoundly shaped black Chicagoans' relationship with HIV AIDS by creating what I term a geography of risk or the socio-spatial production of HIV infection. HIV AIDS could, not, uh, could affect anyone. The risk, however, was higher in black Chicago as a result of structural forces that weighed heaviest on black communities. The geography of risk emerged through public policies and political decisions, not through moral failings. Dr. Snow's ghost map. So I'm going to read a little bit, and I'll just sort of you know, freestyle. In 1854, cholera swept through London for the second time in five years. Thousands died. The city was in a panic. And no one could explain the source of the epidemic. The dominant theory was that the disease was passed through the air. This was the fearful reality until a pioneering young physician discovered the disease's source. Dr. Snow. John Snow is seen by many as the progenitor of descriptive, of descriptive epidemiology or the scientific study of the factors that influence the distribution of disease. Using a series of maps, Snow discovered the source of the pathogen and how it was spread. Working from the theory he had developed that cholera spread either through the food or water system Snow reasoned that there must be some kind of instrument or pathway responsible for its transmission. He suspected that the water system might be the culprit because of the spatial concentration of deaths. So basically what Snow begins to do is he has this sort of remarkable idea. He says, there's no information available, no public death records at this time the UK did not keep them. But he still is trying to figure out where the water source or food source is coming from and where these people are located. So he has a brilliant idea. He goes to local churches, and he pulls records regarding funerals. And all of those records had death information. Most important, where people live. He utilized that information to create a map, to effectively map the epicenter of the cholera outbreak. And here is that map. So I don't have one of those little red pointy things, but uh, I'll just sort of you know, do my best. Uh, so you all can see the, the pump, right? You see Broad Street right there in the middle and the pump. This is the Golden Square community. It was mostly a community of, uh, of um, poor and working class people, some of whom were immigrants. And what Snow discovered is that that pump, or what he reasoned, he, he thought that that pump might be the epicenter of the outbreak. So what Snow does is he maps the deaths, and then he looks at where that water is coming from. What Snow discovers is that private companies that were dumping sewage into a nearby river, the Thames River, was also one of the places where people were getting their water. So effectively, the waste from the community and other communities was being dumped into the river that community members were getting their water supply from. And he discovered that it was through this pump, primarily, that the overwhelming majority of people who had become sick and had died of cholera got their water. So 
Noting the addresses, noting the location of the pump and the addresses of the dead, Snow was able to map the cholera outbreak within the small Golden Square community, which had more than 500 deaths in two months. After Snow discovered that the water was primarily the source of the outbreak, this map was the most effective means to test his hypothesis, and it enabled him eventually to demonstrate exactly which pump contained the contaminated water. Snow's, quote, ghost map, which documented not only the passage of human waste, but also the souls of those living with and dying from cholera, found that the source of the epidemic, found the source of the epidemic and revolutionized medicine by giving rise to epidemiology and epidemiological reasoning. But more than that, Snow's map illustrated how the lives of the poor and marginalized were put at risk. The sewage pipes that contaminated the drinking water of the city's poor were also ref uh, representative of the way marginality was mapped onto the people of Golden Square. I draw on this way of mapping and the social, I draw on this way of mapping the social and structural oppression of blacks in Chicago from 1980 throughout the subsequent 25 years. I also look to Snow's method of reasoning using variables like time, people, location, and understanding, and, and uh, to understand and ultimately ghost map the increased risk of HIV AIDS exposure in black Chicago. My ghost map of HIV AIDS adapts Snow's method by examining how the risks of acquiring HIV was exacerbated by identifying the quote intake pipes and pumps by identifying what the intake pipes and the quote pumps were. As was the case with cholera, the spread of HIV was a man-made epidemic that affected, that affected black Chicago through structural forces. Instead of faulty intake, uh, instead of faulty intake pipes bringing disease into the community, public policy in the form of mass incarceration uh, enlarged the disease's grasp. Let me talk a little bit about now um, HIV AIDS and the crisis um, in black Chicago. Oh, and there's a, a, a nice picture of the Broad Street pump. Actually, you know, parenthetically, so people who've seen me lecture know that I do this, so y'all can just <coughs> flow with it. Um, one of the things that uh, is interesting, uh, all of these images of the Broad Street pump, uh, you know, this, this sort of morbid, you know, death and the ghost map and the sort of souls of people who have been, uh, who disappeared as a result of that pump. Uh, as I was looking through images, I saw these like, like really happy, you know, touristy images of people at the Broad Street pump, which I thought was a bit bizarre and, and morbid. Um, the HIV AIDS crisis in black Chicago. Describing HIV AIDS in black Chicago as a crisis is not an example of creative license, or exercise of creative license. It's an unfortunate life, it's an unfortunate fact of black life in the city. By the beginning of the 21st century, HIV AIDS had a significant impact on black Chicago. For example, blacks accounted for only 14% of the state's population, but made up half of the infections, nearly eight times the infection rate of whites. Black men who had sex with men made up an overwhelming number of the infections, almost two-thirds. However, black women infected through heterosexual contact with black men and, and injection drug users accounted for nearly one-third. The rate of HIV infection for blacks is, an, is a staggering 73.8 per 100,000 compared to 24.7 per 100,000 for whites, so nearly three times the rate. So what we see is a population that constitutes about 14% of the state's population, but they have nearly three times the amount of HIV infection as the largest racial group in the state, which are whites. Substandard health care and barriers to treatment made HIV a near death sentence in Illinois. Between 2000 and 2010, for example, 
3,757 black Chicagoans died of AIDS-related illnesses compared with 1,468 for whites. Oh, there's my slide. Uh, the geography of AIDS is firmly rooted in the black community. Blacks on the south and west sides have high rates of infection. The question is, what caused this? Let me just, you know, I'm a geographer, so you know, we've got to pull out a map at some point in time. So the green here represents black. This is the south side. The green to my left is considered the west side. So you see blacks are spatially concentrated in two particular areas in the city, the south and west side. The reason they are spatially concentrated there is because of historical forms of segregation that were instituted by both custom and law. By 1940, 80% of the housing in Chicago was governed by something called restrictive covenants. Restrictive covenants were legal mandates built into the contract law and deed restriction of housing to ensure that Jews, blacks, Chinese, so on and so forth, could not purchase the homes. So we see state-sanctioned organization of the racial geography of the city dating back to the early part of the 20th century as black people were moving up during the first and second waves of the great black migration, which pretty much correlate with the first and the second world wars. Mid uh, 1917, early 1940s, right? Okay, so correctional institutions. So the, co the question is, blacks have higher rates of of HIV infection, despite their numbers in the state, higher rates of infection and higher rates of death. The question I pose is why? Correctional institutions play an important role in the expansion of the disease. Prisons and jails are crowded, isolated, are cr are crowded, isolated spaces away from the general public, which cons with, with a constantly changing population, mixing in stress, poverty, violence, drug use, high-risk sexual activity, and it's easy to see why jails and prisons are prime sites for the disease to flourish undetected. Geographers have argued that space, particularly confined space, significantly influences the transmission of disease. The geography of carceral institutions provides, as stated, little mobility, few windows, poor ventilation, it encourages tension, has questionable sanitation, and crams people together in tight spaces. Space in this context, therefore, is not simply a description, but rather it is a dynamic actor. Drawing on this thinking, it seems that prisons did two things with respect to HIV AIDS. On the one hand, Prisons were a refuge, enabling the disease to go undetected for years. On the other hand, correctional institutions were a nexus point, bringing vulnerable bodies in close contact with the disease. Ultimately, prisons were pathogenic appendages that removed and recirculated the disease to particular geographies, with infection rates as high as 14 times that on the outside. 14 times that on the outside. Correctional institutions have become a synergy of plagues where HIV, tuberculosis, as, and I was looking at one of the, um, the presentations down the hall uh, that was uh, speaking about uh, hepatitis C, and I'll add hep C, um, combined to create a lethal ecology that wreaked havoc on communities of color across the nation. Because the geography of HIV and the ge uh, because the geography of HIV AIDS and the geography of incarceration are mapped onto one another, the zip codes where HIV AIDS are highest have corresponding rates of incarceration. This is not a coincidence. Rather, it is an illustration of the structural link between confinement and disease, a link that has plagued prisons since the early part of the 20th century. So just to sort of um, just illustrate my point here, so we have, again, 
So we have the sort of racial order of the city here, blacks segregated both on the west and south sides. And then we have uh, the 2009 survey of HIV AIDS, uh, people, li persons living with HIV AIDS in Chicago. Right? This, is all, this is all Chicago. And as we see here, the south and the west sides, I'm sorry about the, uh, uh, not very clear for you, but I can, I can read those out. But as we see, we see larger concentrations of HIV AIDS being concentrated on both the south and the west side. We do have some uh, here in, in the north side, and this is, um, this is actually uh, Boys Town, near Boys Town, uh, which is a historically uh, gay neighborhood, but we generally have them concentrated onto um, black geographies. So again, what role does, do prisons begin to play in this, right? And what are the public policy implications? How does public policy utilize state institutions to generate disproportionate HIV AIDS infection on black communities in general and very particular ones on the south and west sides? HIV AIDS and the, and the war on drugs. Nothing encouraged the black AIDS epidemic more than the war on drugs. High rates of exposure to correction systems, including incarceration, probation, and parole, spurred in large part by the war on drugs, have disproportionately affected African Americans. By, in, by, by increasing the risk, by increasing their risk of infection. HIV AIDS entered carceral institutions in the early 1980s amid Reagan's drug war. It looks like from the, the sense of this audience, like most of y'all weren't here during the early 1980s, but you know, just as a snapshot, the, the drug war was actually started um, under Nixon in, 19, in 1972 is when the, it's first articulated. And Nixon's version of the drug war differed drastically from Reagan's. For example, Nixon, Nixon actually thought treatment would be an effective mechanism for dealing with drug abuse. And what we see under Reagan, one, two, Bush, and so on and so forth, is that punishment becomes the main way of waging war against drugs. Okay. Um, fought almost exclusively on black geographies throughout the nation. The war on drugs disproportionately affected blacks in general and black men in particular. For example, between 1985 and 2000, drug offenses accounted for more than half of the state prison population and two thirds of the federal prison population. Half of the people in prison by 2005, which is about one and a half million, were incarcerated for drugs, compared with only 41,000 in 1980. So, I mean, you look at that significant expansion over a couple of decades. By the early part of the 21st century, more than half of the population that is incarcerated for drugs were in the early 1980s, 41,000, at the dawn of the Reagan administration. This deployment of carceral power into black geographies created unprecedented incarceration rates that have disproportionately affected black men. In 1984, for instance, one out of every 30 black men was incarcerated. In 1997, that ratio was one out of every 15. The drug war's consequence was so devastating that by 2001, a black boy had a 32% chance of being incarcerated in his lifetime. These statistics illustrate both the scale of black mass incarceration and the lopsided racial disparities of policing and persecution and prosecution. And I just have to just throw in just one, um, one more fact about uh, the drug war. So, you know, as I said, they, it, the drug war was fought on black geographies. It was about arresting people 
It was about arresting people hand to hand who were selling. It was about arresting users. It was about kicking, that, kicking in doors. I'm sure you've all seen footage or read footage or read information about it. But the, the I don't want to call it an irony, but for lack of a better term, but the, the, the real irony is that for over the last three decades, drug use among blacks and whites has been fairly consistent. Blacks and whites use drugs at roughly the same rate. But the drug war was not waged in white communities. It was not waged in small towns, suburbs. It was waged in black, working, and poor communities. And those people built, uh, those people were, had to deal with the repercussions of it significantly more. And the implications of that are dramatic, one of which is the higher rates of HIV AIDS among those populations. And actually, according to some new research uh, that just came out about two years ago, that young whites between the ages of 13 and 21 use, rates, use drugs at higher rates than anyone else in the nation. But what we have is public policy and the figure of blacks as the major users, consumers, and sellers of the drug that drove police departments, mayors, state senators, legislatures, and even presidents to ensure that those communities were the place where the war on drugs was waged. As black men entered prisons in large numbers, HIV AIDS followed. While we know little about these early cases, what is known is that they were most likely intravenous drug users who had acquired the disease through needle sharing. The migration of HIV AIDS into prison was an explicit consequence of the war on drugs that gave courts new powers to arrest, prosecute, and lock up sellers and addicts. The war on drugs, if we follow Snow's logic, the war on drugs, therefore, was the intake pipe that moved HIV AIDS from the street into the prison, the geography of risk in prison. One of the primary ways mass incarceration has contributed to the rise of HIV AIDS in black communities is through the loss of black men from their community. This loss has disrupted the male-female ratio in ways that, have, that has exacerbated sexually transmitted diseases like HIV. For instance, in 19, uh, between 1990 and 1999, the only period for which this information was available, for every 100,000 residents in Chicago, the city had more than 500 people affected with gonorrhea. And the, the geography of those locations were largely in black and Latino communities on both the south and west side. But during this same period, HIV, AIDS, HIV um, also rose. In 1990, for example, there were 700, in 1990, there were 700 cases of HIV in the state. In 1991, there was 1,115. In 1992, 93, and 94, there were 2011, 2071, and 1,438 cases, respectively. In 1993, there were 177 AIDS-related deaths in Illinois state prisons. In that same year, for the first time ever, deaths from HIV AIDS surpassed the number of deaths from murder, suicide, heart attack, and cancer. In 94, the IDOC had 119 prisoners diagnosed with AIDS and another 468 who were HIV positive. During this same period, black people constituted 65% of the prison population, which means that the majority of AIDS deaths people identified as HIV positive were black. So what we begin to see here is that the rising numbers of black incarceration that is specifically, again, waged through the war on drugs in black communities ushers in tens of thousands of black people 
particularly poor and working class black men who constitute 90% of the IDOC population, 90%, right? We see this population being largely affected by higher rates of infection in prison and higher rates of death from the disease. These sexually transmitted diseases expanded in part through the prison's geography of risk, which banned the use and distribution of condoms. Sex among prisoners, as I'm sure you all know, or at least may have imagined, is not uncommon. And policies, every, all 50 states, uh, 49 of the 50 states do not allow for men in prison to access condoms. Neither do federal prisons. The lone state that allows you to get a condom is Vermont. <laughs> the lone state, the lone state. And, and, um, and so this is, this is something that we'll, 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 have to, we'll have to talk more about. OK. Um, tattooing also puts prisoners at risk. Tattooing equipment in prison is unsanitary and shared among many people, as well as intravenous drugs, as well for intravenous drug users, needle sharing and other uh, needle sharing with other prisoners is common. These needles are rarely cleaned and can easily harbor pathogens. Sex between men, consensual and unconsensual, needle sharing and tattooing are the primary risk factors for the spread of the disease among prisoners. These factors produce risk most state and federal, and uh, these, these factors produce risk because, as stated, most state and federal prisoners do not allow for condoms, nor do they allow for clean needles, and many of them, they do not allow prisoners to have access or use agents like, uh, use things like bleach to clean uh, tattooing equipment and or needles. Finally, um, the lack of testing among prisoners encourages risk. The IDOC does not have any mandatory testing for the disease. HIV can only be discovered when it is detected through a health screening. So you're in prison, you, you cut your foot, you go in and you, get, you have to get a tetanus shot and you know, some other tests are done. And it's only in that way that you can access health care. Right? And also, even more, prisoners cannot ask to access health care. There has to be a physical demonstration of need, vomiting, fever, what have you. Prisoners cannot go up and say, can I have a test for this? Can I be tested for what have you? There has to be a physical demonstration of need. Um, so the institution's role as a, as a high-risk setting for the transmission of HIV AIDS is due both to the prevalence of HIV among inmate populations and the high-risk activities that occur within prison walls. For instance, in 1998, the CDC tested 2,392 prisoners in an Illinois prison, Joliet prison, for HIV. The test revealed 4% of the prisoners were HIV positive. One year later, the same prisoners were retested. Seven prisoners who originally tested negative were found to be positive. One explanation is that the test may have been wrong. The more likely explanation is that prisoners acquired the disease while in prison, either through tattooing, sex, or needle exchange. This raises concerns not only for the health of the prison population and the staff, but also for the communities these people return to. Over 90% of the people who are incarcerated will get out. 90%, and they will be paroled back into their communities. So what does this mean for places like Black Chicago? Well, I'll tell you. 
If the war on drugs and the police were the intake pipes that moved the disease from the streets to prison, the IDOC was the pump that recirculated the plague back into black Chicago. With a disproportionate number of black Chicagoans entering and leaving prison since the mid-1970s, due in large part to the war on drugs, prison was not just a holding facility. They were also appendages that facilitated the movement of pathogens within black communities. During the early years, up until the early 1990s, HIV was seen as primarily a gay disease, and many people outside the gay community saw themselves as immune. This was a grave miscalculation. HIV AIDS was, was de uh, uh, while HIV AIDS was devastating gay communities across the nation, it was quietly entering black communities. Sex between men was one of the primary ways men were being infected, but it was not the only avenue. Intravenous drug use also played a major role in the black AIDS epidemic. Research shows that blacks were disproportionately affected by HIV infection intravenously. Between 1980 and 1989, for example, 318 black intravenous drug users died of AIDS-related illnesses in Chicago. Between 1990 and 1991, that number exploded to 2,379. Because black Chicagoans and black communities were the focus of the drug war, their use of intravenous drugs not only put them at risk for HIV, but also put them at risk for, e for incarceration. Now, the spatial distribution of drug arrest overlays the entrenched segregation that marked the city during the 20th century. Despite the fact that blacks and whites used drugs at nearly identical rates, blacks were arrested, were arrested for drug violations at higher percentages than whites. Whites seldom saw felony drug charges, even when they were repeat offenders. Drug arrests were overwhelmingly concentrated on the south and west sides of the city where blacks had lived for numerous years. For instance, between 1980 and 1998, drug arrests in Cook County, home of Chicago. So, uh, yes, here we go. Um, uh, drug arrests in Cook County grew from 30,000 to 100,000 annually. This went a long way toward blacks making up 65% of the prison population. As a result, by 2000, the top, 10, the top 15 zip codes for prisoners released, a staggering 71% of Chicago's parolees came from the south and west sides of the city. All right, so let me just show just a couple things here. Okay, so Cook County, right? We see Cook, 75% of black people in the state of Illinois live in Cook County in two places, the south and the west sides. As we see, this is a state map. And we see there's Cook County up there, right? We see a smattering of blacks placed throughout the, the, the rest of the state, roughly 25%. And then we look at counties with highest percentages of parolees in Illinois. Over half of the parolees in the state of Illinois come from Cook County. And of that, 71% of them come from 10 zip codes on the south and west sides of the city. All right, and that's a, a, a state map. All right, and here we have the distribution throughout the city. South side, west side. Right, and if I, if I were to sort of lay these over, you see the correlation between HIV, the racial demography of the city, and arrest rates, effectively being mapped onto one another. Now, these striking figures, to use Michelle Wallace's formulation, tell us much about how the new Jim Crow affects black communities. And it also illuminates the cross-pollination between HIV, AIDS, and prison. Swept up in the drug war, black Chicagoans, particularly those with addictions to intravenous drugs, brought the disease into the prison system. This migration had severe consequences for both the prison system and for black Chicago. As was the case for Lester Wall and the four other victims, 
one of which contracted the disease while in prison. Being in prison with HIV meant a death sentence. Consider these numbers. Between 1985 and 1990, the number of deaths from AIDS-related illnesses in prisons grew from 8,000 8, to 94,375 nationally. By 1994, AIDS was the leading cause of death in the IDOC. Between 1984, when Lester Wall was diagnosed with the disease, and 1993, 177 new cases were diagnosed in the IDOC. In 93 alone, the disease claimed the lives of 23 prisoners. The rate of death for prisoners was much higher than it was for those outside prison. In 1992, AIDS was the 11th leading cause of death in the entire state, with one out of every 100 people succumbing to, succumbing to the disease. In prison, it was one out of every four. HIV AIDS and the coercive mobility of black men. So this was one of the interesting things about doing this research, is that I began to discover the implications, the negative implications of mass incarceration. It wasn't only that people were locked in a cell, that they had been confronted by higher risks of HIV AIDS in a place that might be violent, bad windows, bad ventilation. It wasn't, it wasn't only that. One of the primary consequences was their return home and what that meant, not just for their families, their wives, girlfriends, children, but for the entire community. Public health scholars Bracewhite, Hammett, and Mayberry argue that the large number of prisoners who return home from correctional institutions can facilitate the spread of HIV within their communities if high risk practices persist. The revolving door between black Chicago and the IDOC is an example of what the sociologist Todd Clear calls coercive mobility, where stable, portion, where stable portions of the population cycle between community and prison. In the process of this back and forth, the community becomes destabilized. Some black communities in Chicago experience this coercive mobility on a large scale. Each year, Illinois releases 35,000 prisoners from state institutions, and that figure is 700,000 nationally. More than 60% go to just 15 zip codes on the south and west side. While much of black Chicago is affected by the burden of coercive mobility, the heaviest portion falls on specific communities, right? Inglewood, Roseland, right? Um, uh, Inglewood, Roseland, Hawthorne Park, right? Those communities have large num larger numbers of people who are confronting HIV AIDS and higher numbers of people um, who have been incarcerated. Indeed, mass incarceration has woven itself into the fabric of these communities to such a degree that it not only facilitates the disappearance of people, but it also leaves severed ties that undermine the social fabric of the community. It's not only men's departure that destabilizes the, the, this community, but it's also their return. Studies have shown that returning prisoners have lower job prospects, are not as skilled, either do not vote or are barred from voting, may have psychological wounds, feel isolated, have housing instability, can be withdrawn from others, experience anger issues, and as demonstrated, have poor health. HIV AIDS considerably complicates the residential instability of returning prisoners. Many returning prisoners continue high-risk high activities such as engaging in, in, in intravenous drug use or, or not using condoms. The effects of these practices are compounded by the lack of health coverage and the stigma surrounding HIV, which shut down discussions about the disease within many black communities. As a result, returning prisoners are locked in what one prisoner terms a whirlpool of risk. Now, the rapid expansion of HIV positive black women in Chicago since the early 2000s is a salient demonstration 
of the coercive form of mobility that mass incarceration produces regarding HIV AIDS. Men constitute the majority of the people in the IDOC, roughly 90%. They are the, majorities of, they are the majority of the carriers of HIV AIDS in prison. They die from it more than women and move between home and prison at a, at a faster rate and a bigger volume than women do. Despite these realities, black women in Chicago and nationally are the fastest growing HIV positive group. For example, in 2008, black women in Chicago constituted 80% of all new cases and the overwhelming majority of them were infected via heterosexual contact. Why are black women being afflicted with the disease at such high rates when the geographic and social conditions encourage its spread among men? I'll tell you. The major reason is the imbalance of available black men for black women. Research on this topic demonstrates that high rates of black male incarceration and premature death are, in, are culprits for this imbalance. In Chicago, for, extent, for instance, 85, there are 85 black men to every 100 women. 85 black men to every 100 women. In 2000, black men aged 25 to 34 experienced 261 deaths per 100,000. For men between the age of 35 and 34 and 44, it was 453. This compounded by high incarceration, uh, this was, is compounded by high incarceration rates, right? As I stated, 90% men, the overwhelming majority of them in particular communities. And so what we begin to see is that premature death, high incarceration rates create this imbalance, right? And what happens with this imbalance? Well, effectively what happens with this imbalance is that black men in these communities have no incentive to have single partners. They can have multiple partners simultaneously. And men throughout the nation tend to have more sexual partners over a lifetime than women do. And black men in particular have the second highest rate of sexual partners over a lifetime among racial groupings. And so what we have is a disincentive to have single sexual partners. Two, we have people who have moved in and out of carceral institutions that may have appropriated really troubling habits in terms of no condom usage, either in prison or out. They may have drug issues that are not being grappled with that continue while they are out. And that back and forth enables them to have profound implications, right? Enables them to, to spread the disease in ways that are detrimental to the entire community. It's not simply one person, one partner who could be subject. It is the entire community. And with rates as high and as dense as they are in parts of black Chicago, where in some places up to 8% of the male population has served time in prison, the extent to which these people move the disease from prisons into communities or exacerbate the existing presence of the communities, the existing presence of the disease in their communities is significant. Where are we at in time? OK, I'm wrapping up now. We'll read my conclusion, and then I'm going to talk about what must be done. Unfolding the spatial and migratory and political forces that help to create Chicago's black AIDS crisis reveals the complex ways that social realities threaten black health. Black HIV, the black HIV AIDS crisis is a consequence of the war on drugs. 
the destructive attention paid to drug use and the prison boom it engendered rapidly accelerated the expansion of the disease in Chicago. H the HIV AIDS crisis in Chicago also reveals the need to rethink the country's reliance on prisons as a way to solve what are ultimately social problems. Conventional wisdom might suggest that not going to prison at all, or even worse, longer stays in prison or better sexual values might help to stifle the spread of HIV, AIDS in black communities. However, these answers normalize prison punishment. They do not address the ways in which black people are marked as criminal and the profound economic realities that land many blacks in prison. Such sentiments do not take into account the vast forms of containment that enable the disease, and they make conservative sexual mores the arbiter of ending the scourge of AIDS. Sex is not what produces HIV AIDS. Rather, poverty, instability, and containment are its culprits. Now, what must be done? I think this is probably the most important part of my talk. One ideological thing must be done, and three practical, policy-based things must be done. One, as stated, we as a society must confront the fact that incarceration has been detrimental to the poor and people of color, and we must begin the process of moving away from our reliance on prisons to solve social issues such as poverty. Public protests, the closing of prisons in New York, California, and Illinois, and the president's acknowledgment just in last night's State of the Union address that the criminal justice system must change are indicators that the time is right for rethinking our relationship to incarceration. My practical ones. Jails, juvenile detention centers, and prisons must have mandatory testing for all detainees. Those that are positive should be provided with treatment and wraparound services like mental health care and housing. Particularly, it's difficult for anyone to come out of one of these facilities. But for those who have severe health problems, housing becomes even more difficult, health care becomes ne even more necessary, and mental health care becomes essential. So we have to find some way to deal with this situation that is man-made and socially produced. We need to extend and greatly subsidize the provisions of the Affordable Care Act to parolees and their families. The 10 million that are covered under the act, as mentioned by President Obama in his State of the Union, last night can be extended to millions more if their families are brought into the system. Mass incarceration and the geography of risk did much to create the public health crisis that black Chicagoans face, but the lack of health care for the poor, particularly returning prisoners and their families, was an enabler. We must find ways to extend the Affordable Care Act to those populations before another health crisis emerges. Finally, how do we pay for this? We can pay for these extensions if we seriously consider point number one. If we begin to break our addiction to incarceration, we can redistribute some of the funds to pay for extending health care and other wraparound services to parolees and their families. We should do this because it's ethical, it's cheaper, and it's a more effective use of public resources. On average, it costs taxpayers $39 billion nationally to keep people in prison. And this is just based on 40 states. That money wastes lives, devours social wealth, and produces health crises, which ultimately cost lives and more money. Shifting some of that funding to health care, as well as education, job training, for instance, can extend the health benefits and wraparound services at lower cost and provide life-sustaining treatment 
to people who are underserved. Moreover, we can use those funds to help subsidize the training of primary care physicians to serve this population in need. 50 years ago, 60 years ago, when Dr. King called for his Poor People's Campaign, he did so because he understood that one of the greatest impediments to extending democratic rights to black Americans was the deep and persistent poverty that they lived in and the negative impact it had on their lives. My presentation today evokes that political spirit. If, as the hashtag, Black Lives Matter, um, let me say that again. My presentation today evokes that political spirit. If, as the hashtag suggests that Black Lives Matter, I hope that you all see that one of the ways to demonstrate that Black Lives Matter is to create institutions that are not public crises, but instead to create institutions that become spaces of hope. Thank you all for allowing me to come and speak to you. <laughs> Now the fun part, questions, points of clarification. If you'd like me to extend on something, thoughts, throw it at me. Yes? Can you just read the name of your book coming out in September? Spatializing Blackness. Thank you. University of Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> gotta, you know, gotta give you all of it. Yes? So it's always been my hypothesis that one of the tenets of Health disparity and the health inequities is just how we produce physicians and academic institutions. And I still really believe that that's the case. And so, where were the physicians in this story? What were they doing? What were they saying? How were they fighting? Yeah. What were they saying? Uh, the, the research in Chicago, they, they weren't present. A couple of reasons. One, the IDOC didn't want to spend much money to deal with the to deal with the issue. So, you know, this was before this is pre-antiretroviral in the late 80s and early 90s, and so the, as a result, the death rates were higher. But the political will to do something about it butted up against the ideological belief that they were prisoners, and if they had HIV/AIDS and they were imprisoned and they were dying. You know, it was sort of part of the punishment mechanism. And so state institutions did very little. There was very little public assistance. Um, many of these people had no access to health care once they returned home. There were very few clinics. And so the death rate began to spiral and spiral. And physicians had very little. Physicians could only respond in very particular ways. And much of the health care that many of these people got was actually in prison. Once they left, it was, it was, it was all done. Um, so physicians were not, were not there, which is, why the, which is why Obamacare is so important. But I think it's also why a very targeted expansion of Obamacare to deal with the 700,000 parolees a year and their families to ensure that they have some kind of health care. And for those who, are, who have uh, life-threatening illnesses such as HIV, cancer, that we have all of these wraparound services for them and for their families. And we can pay for those. Like That $39 billion that is being spent on prisons, we can slice a portion of that off. And we can utilize those funds to pay, pay for these groups. And I think Part of that means that we have to train a new generation of primary care physicians, particularly, to work with these populations, have community health centers that are in the neighborhoods that people can easily get to through a bus or a walk, and there are funds available. The problem is, can we, can we get over that ideological hump of believing that the money we're spending on these institutions is working for us. That's the big, that's the, I think that's the big 
big issue. And if we can, if we can begin to grapple with that and rethink our reliance on that institution, then I think the, the door really opens up and it creates all kinds of possibilities that extend from the university system on right on down to um, neighborhoods. Yeah, they, they are private, and you can see the incentive, you know, so the, they're, they're private, and the state gives the, the, the prison so much for it, you know, a million dollars, five million dollars, what have you. And the whole point is to make sure you come in under budget, so that means certain things have to get cut. And you don't want to, necess you don't want to unnecessarily bring people into the system. Henceforth, no screening. Because if you catch it while it comes in, the state is on the hook for taking care of it. So states, all 50 states and the federal government, do not screen upon entering and exiting. And this just creates, you know, this has devastating implications for those communities. Because they're all going back there, over 90%, they go back, right? And, you know, there's, there's the sort of regular health care concerns, heart disease, cancer, all of those things that prisoners are confronted with. But then you have something like HIV, which is you know, sexually transmitted. And given the, you know, given the population, given the, the gender of the population, given where they're going back to, and also given this sort of disparity in terms of partners, right? You know, and this is something I didn't say, so I'm, so I'm sorry to like, go off on a tangent on your point, but the reason why that research around um, where prisoners are going back to and the, the disproportion between men and women is because, like everybody in here, we all date and have sex in particular geographies. Nobody in here is sleeping with someone 200 miles away. If you are, you're not doing it often. You sleep with people who are close. You know, that's the, that's the point, you know. They need to be like 20 minutes away, so you can call up at 10 o'clock and be like, can I swing through? <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's the point, you know? I mean, proximity is key. We date and sleep with people who are close, all right? So there's, there was a study done in Chicago from 1994 to 2004, one of the most extensive studies done on urban sexuality ever, 150,000 uh, people involved, and they took samples from the south side, the west side, the north side, across race, across class lines. And in Chicago, the radius that people dated and had sex with people was less than a mile. So if you, if you lived on the south side, you slept with black folks. If you lived on the north side, you slept with white folks. If you lived in this part of the west side, you slept with black folks. And if you lived around here, mostly Latino. So this illustrates two things. One, the racial geography of where we live influences our choices about partners. Like, I know we like to think like, oh, you know, I chose her because, you know, she was nice, and, you know, she had good hair, she had cute boots or whatever, <laughs> you know. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that what, what really, what, what profoundly influences your, your choice is the fact that the people in that neighborhood are racially organized in very specific ways. And so 
what this says is that if you come out of prison and you go into a black neighborhood, those are your sexual partners. If you do it and you go into a Latino neighborhood, so on and so forth, right? And given the fact that all of this has been concentrated in these black neighborhoods means that black women particularly, right, black women particularly have to be confronted with the reality of or the possibility of their sexual partners having done time and the negative implications that come along with that, that are psychic and physical, right? So, so, so as we see the geography of segregation influencing our sexual choices, and I, and I argue that they also inf influence things like desire, like who is seen as desirable. If everybody in your community is white and look a very particular way, why wouldn't that influence your understanding of desirability and beauty? It, does, it totally does, it totally does. And I also just throw one thing you know, into this. You know, in this moment of like uber connectivity, and, you know, everybody's like you know, Facebook, Twitter, you know, what have you, all over, you know, transgressing domestic and international borders, right? The overwhelming majority of our sexual choices are still interracial. The overwhelming majority, like 93%. Despite all of the, you know, the rhetoric about the liberal society, and, you know, openness, and I can date, you know, I can connect with somebody in, you know, Bangladesh tonight if I want to. But because we live and are rooted in deeply segregated societies, like the fact is, everybody in here comes from a segregated community, most likely. There's only a handful of multiracial communities in the United States, a handful. So that influences our sexual choices which influences things like where you buy a house, where you send your kids to, ch where you send your children to school, how your house appreciates over time, whether or not you can take the value of that house and pass it on to the next generation. You know, segregation has cascading effects. And you know, my point today is really about the ways in which segregation shapes and informs the extent to which black women are confronted with certain, certain realities when they look for partners. Right. And the way in which the drug war has, has helped to inform that. So, so you know, sort of turling all of, coming all the way back around to your point. I mean, so then you know, how do we therefore get states to confront the public health crisis that prisons produce? Because they're, they're producing a serious, serious crisis. And and you know, in all of my research. I did, you know, when I got halfway through it, I discovered that like hepatitis C was worse in a lot of ways. And, you know, when you throw in cancer and heart disease and just the, the stress that comes from being incarcerated and when you, people get out, the kind of implications that has for their children, you know, the people in their lives, their friends, their family members, all of that. I mean, the health crisis that these institutions produce is profound. And that stuff is being concentrated in particular neighborhoods. And we have to figure out a different way to, to respond to it. And so again, we have to cut some of that 40 billion off. And we can, we, I think we can redistribute it and begin to do something about these things. I'm just wondering about what people are really at risk for now. Like when all the medical things are shifted now, HIVs work on a condition and gerotitis, there's some really amazing things out there that are happening right now. Yeah. And then we have formerly our disease and obesity, that's all that's going on. And how how this would play into it. Absolutely. I, I think all of those things, I think the, you know, the model, you know, you know, Dr. Snow's model, like I just ad ad adapted it for this. But you know, Dr. Snow's model of attempting to sort of map chronic disease, I'm sure we can utilize this to find, you know, like, like if, if just off the top of my head, you know, I can think about things like um, obesity, especially in, in Chicago. You know, I grew up there, and, you know, I have my own understanding of it. But you can just see how um, obesity, you know, stress and obesity can sort of cycle in and out of these institutions and have negative implications on, obviously, the people, uh, their families, their communities. I mean, you know, it can, it can extend 
significantly. So, um, so I don't know of any, um, I don't know what the sort of new health crisis is, but I do know that it is probably already present or very much on its way. You know, I'm interested in some disease processes, but we're beginning to think about intergenerational effects. Mm. So if the mm. grandmother and the grandfather experience mm. something, is there an increased likelihood that two generations uh, down the road that the same thing is occurring? So have you been able to clock HIV positivity amongst um, offspring of people or generation? Um, I I haven't done that. That's a that's a great that's a great question. And I think now the the data is sort of slowly coming available. It's now you know three decades in. Yeah. No, I haven't. I haven't done that. Um, project waiting to be done. We should we should talk. <laughs> we should talk. Absolutely. Any other questions, comments? Yes, sir. What do you think about living in Burlington? I mean, I think it's an incredible. Laboratory of yeah. society, you know, racial dynamic and socioeconomic. I think Burlington is interesting in a, in a lot of ways because it, you know, I think I read somewhere that 50% of Burlingtonians, or maybe even 60% of Burlingtonians, are not from Burlington. So it's this, you know this sort of place where lots of people have come from elsewhere. And I think that's what gives it its sort of unique, kind of funky flavor. Um, you know, makes it very idiosyncratic in a lot of ways. I think, like personally, I'm a, I'm a big city, you know, you know, big city person. So I do miss miss big cities. But I think Burlington really offers this kind of really interesting, unique um, kind of enclave because it's. It's small town, like it's urban small town, or you know, urban towny. I guess is one of the ways you can, you can um, uh, describe it. But um, I mean, I think. Do you mean just like what do I think about it personally, or what do I think about it in terms of like? Yeah, we have like, yeah, like the healthiest communities right. in America. Right. Yeah, where we also have huge opiate problems. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just an incredible mix of. Yeah, and you know, I think Burlington is able to, uh, Burlington is confronted by the realities of the state in ways that like Chicago is not of Illinois. Like all of Illinois doesn't manifest in Chicago. Chicago is its, its own thing and the rest of Illinois is somewhat separate. Uh, but Burlington is, Burlington is confronted by all of the social, economic, political, uh, realities that exist statewide. So, you know, the poverty, the opium, like all of those things manifest that are manifesting in you know small towns all throughout the state. Really, have they they play themselves out here? And I think as a result of that, Burlington um, has kind of big city problems. I think in that respect. But I think, but I also think Burlington is somewhat of an enclave because it's relatively expensive to live in Burlington. And so there's a way in which Burlington can sort of stave off some of the, the major urban problems on one hand, but is also confronted by the, the, the realities of a mostly rural state. And I think it, it hovers in that kind of nexus you know, in ways that like Chicago like Chicago doesn't deal with the, the rural reality of like Springfield, and, um, um, but, but Burlington deals with what's going on in Rutland. Like that's, that's just so ever present here. I think always will be. Question, yes sir. Uh, you mentioned a lot about cutting the funding for prisons, yeah. just for the 39 billion thing. Yeah. But I mean obviously you can't just cut it well, with the, the same amount of prison population. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess, so you would be inclined to change drug laws? Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, the, the, the president started that last year when he effectively began to scale down the, the, the war on drugs. Um, and so there's, there's, you know, effectively defunding the war drug, the, the, the war on drugs is part of that. 
Um, I also think that initial diversion from prison is the second. This is the second step, right? You know, we've just been accustomed to, you know, you do this, you go here, and we need alternatives. And I think those alternatives um, are much more effective on the people who who are being punished. I think they are much more cost effective, and I think they are much more socially effective. You know, they I, I think they generate and they nurture the creative. Um, and social wealth of the population rather than undermine it, which I think is what, what prisons do. And so if we can begin to do those things, we can begin to close more prisons. And, and the state of New York, you know, our, our sister, has been closing prisons uh, over the last four years. They've closed two or three. Illinois closed a couple. California's forced to close them under court order. So. What we're seeing is that you know, these, these budgets are starting to shrink a little bit. And, and believe it or not, the group who has been most instrumental in looking at prison funding has been conservatives. Why? Because they're looking at this budget and they're saying, $987 million for people in prison. And we have 3,000 of them, 4,000 of them. We have to do something. You know, it's that sort of fiscally minded you know, and they have really been some of the ones on the front, um, on the front burners of it in, in, in Texas as well. So, and I think the time is right, right now, for states to really say, okay, we are going to rethink how we spend money in the Department of Corrections. And if, we, if, they can, if states can scale back 10% over the next few years, that money can be diverted into some of these kinds of programs or others that states feel are useful. Very interesting. That's it. And you know, that's Nixon's whole, Nixon's whole thing. 30% of the drug war for him was on rehab. You know, tricky dick, who would have thought, right? <laughs> you know. Well, it's a little after 7, and I would like to thank Dr. Um, Shabazz.